guys brought your uh, buddy barrels or if you just want to give to this offering. Uh, real quickly, this offering um, is a missions offering. We take this uh, change, dollar bills. If you can give online if you'd like, uh, just put missions offering on there, buddy barrel offering, whichever one you want. And all this goes into our missions organization. And so uh, simple stuff like if a missionary needs a pair of glasses or something like that, then we buy it out of this money. And uh, we're able to help our missionaries and bless them. And uh, we've sent some money out of this organization to Peter and Evie before uh, for different things. And so they're not the only ones, of course. But uh, we have just blessed our missionaries whenever we feel, uh, feel like God's leading us to do so. So if you brought your Buddy Barrel, buddy barrel <laughs> offering, uh, Buddy Bell was the one that kind of started this. If you brought your Buddy Barrel offering, uh, bring it on up and dump it in there. Amen. I didn't pre-warn the guys, so I don't have any music, so therefore, uh, you get me ad-libbing then. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, and we have barrels. If you guys would like a barrel to put on your uh, uh, nightstand, wherever you want to put it, put it in your car, we have barrels. You can raise your hand, and the ushers will get those to you. I always forget the barrels, Dave, and... I always forget the barrels. All right. Amen. amen. If you would, stretch your hands out here. And again, if you want a barrel, just let one of the ushers know and they'll get you uh, one of those barrels. Father, we thank you for this change, these dollar bills. We, we bless this offering and we sow it into the mission field in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 All right. Well, greetings. Uh, I got to get rid of this or I'll... Uh, Regret that later. Kevin's mad at me already. Kyle's the only one laughing at me. <clears throat> it's okay. It's an inside joke. Uh, greetings and blessings to you guys today. Uh, I want to start by saying it's always an honor uh, to, to be able to, uh, for Pastor to ask me to stand up here and preach. Uh, it's an honor for me to do this. It's an honor for Pastor to ask me. And so I do not take this lightly, and it's a blessing. I will tell you, and I told Pastor Brian this uh, earlier in the service, that um, how many of you guys have had a corporate job where you first started and uh, you got the grunt work? Thank you. That's what Pastor Ted did to me on this sermon. I know he's watching. He'll get on to me when he gets back. It's okay. It's all good. That's what he did. He planned his Africa trip around this scripture right here. He said, ah, Travis will cover it and then I can clean it up next week. He's got a great sermon next week. It's like the best scripture in the world. That's why he's pastor. He can do that. Amen. All right. The title of my sermon is Money. Matter of fact... Matter of fact, I titled it Money, Money, Money. Three times. So let's talk about James. James chapter 5. I'm going to do the first 12 verses in James chapter 5. So let's talk about James. So, pastor does this every week, so you guys should not look at me like a deer in the headlights. So, who was James? And why did he write this book? Right, James was the brother of Jesus. And why did he write this book? They were all scattered, all right? They were all over the region. James himself was a pastor, so he was writing to the Israelites that were scattered abroad. And so uh, my, my take on James, uh, the pastor may have mentioned this or not, and I, maybe I didn't listen to him, but my take on James was James was writing in a time of turmoil and trouble. People were anxious, and they were, they were nervous about the future. Because now remember, from the time that Jesus Christ died on the cross, and rose again on the third day. From that moment, when he rose on the third day, at that moment, everybody in the, in the world was expecting the second coming of Jesus Christ. Hold on. From the time he ascended into heaven. Because, you know, he walked on earth for a little bit after he, after he rose from the grave. Okay. Sorry. Let me rephrase that. So from the time he ascended into heaven, from that moment in time that he left the earth and went into heaven... Everybody has expected the second coming of Jesus Christ and said, and said these words, we are living in the last days. From the time he ascended into heaven, everybody said we're living in the last days. And we're still saying it. Correct? My mom was at my house Wednesday 
And she took me, oh, I was moving this week, long story short. Anyway, I was moving. My mom came over, bought me lunch. So that's a whole nother sermon about being spoiled. We won't go into that. <laughs> anyway, because I, I was working, Laura was at work, so never mind. That's a long story. So anyway, my mom came over and bought me lunch. And as we're sitting at the lunch table, eating lunch at Boomerangs in Claymore, Oklahoma, my mom said, we're living in the last days. In Boomerang, eating a hamburger. So everybody thinks we're living in the last days, and we have been forever since Jesus ascended. So James was writing in these times that his church had ascended. They were scattered. They were living in turmoil and trouble, and they thought Jesus was going to return. And so they're panicking, running around, doing stupid stuff because they were panicking. That's my take on James. Now, I was also raised in, a, in kind of an environment where, um, as, as Pastor did mention, that, uh, what was it, uh, um, was it Luther that didn't want James in the Bible and wouldn't preach it? Is that right? Did I say that right? Okay. I grew up in a time where that was a true statement. The church, the, most of the churches that I attended as a young man never taught the book of James. Never. Not in Sunday school. Matter of fact, I had one Sunday school teacher that I can tell you that I do remember very specifically that when the, the you know, the, have, if any of you guys ever been to a Baptist church and had quarterlies, okay, it's all spelled out. Okay, you get your quarterly and so you know, you know on September the 18th, you're going to learn this lesson right here because it says on September the 18th, I'm going to learn this. Okay, everybody know what I'm talking about? When it would get to the book of James, we would go to the next quarterly. We'd skip it. Either that or he would ad-lib and do something on his own. I mean, so we just thought, you know. So, you know, I struggled with the book of James because that's the, that's the, the generation or that's, the, that's how I was raised. It was my, it was my uh, mindset. It was my focus. And so as I got older and more mature, I started reading the book of James. <clears throat> I read it the first time when I had no business reading it because <laughs> I wasn't mature enough to handle it. That's another thing about James. James is always trying to get you to mature. Yes. Everything James says is a, is a sign of maturity, of growing up as a Christian. I'm not going to say he didn't like baby Christians, but he didn't want you to stay there. So, having said all that, I think that's the basis of where I'm going today. God doesn't want us to be baby Christians. So... We go to James chapter 5, verse 1. Now, I'm going to read this out of the message uh, translation. Remember the perspective. James is preaching to a group of people that are thinking that Jesus is coming back. Okay? So, get that in your perspective. So, here we're talking about people that think we're in the end days. Jesus is going to come back any time now. Any time. Okay? It's just imminent. It's going to happen any time. So most of you guys are familiar. I'm going to just give you just a little snippet here. Most of you would be familiar with this translation. Okay, and then this is not where I'm going to read. So Kenny, just go ahead and leave it up there. But most of you would be familiar. Look here, you rich people. Weep and groan with anguish because of the terrible troubles ahead of you. Your wealth is rotting away. Most of you, most of you would be familiar with that kind of a translation. Kind of a King James. Your clothes and your, your, the, your clothes will be moth-written. Moth eaten. Okay, most of you be familiar with that. So, in my wife's wisdom, she looked up in the message and she said, you need to read that in the message. Okay, yes ma'am, I can obey. So I'm going to read it in the message. <clears throat> the message says, James 5, chapter 1, verse 1, says, and, and the final word to you arrogant rich. Take some lessons in lament, sorrow. Take some lessons in sorrow. You will need buckets for your tears when the crash comes upon you. Your money is corrupt and your fine clothes stink. Your greedy luxuries are a cancer in your gut, destroying your life from within. You thought you were pulling or piling up wealth. What you've piled up is a judgment. All the workers that you've exploited and cheated cry out for judgment. The groans of the workers you used and abused 
are a roar in the ears of the masters avengers. You've looted the earth, you've lived it up, but all you have to show for it is a fattened, fatter than usual corpse. In fact, what you have done is condemned and murdered perfectly good persons who stand there and take it. Meanwhile, friends, wait patiently for the master's arrival. You see farmers do this all the time, waiting for their valuable crops to mature, patiently letting the rain do its slow but sure work. Be patient like that. Stay steady and strong. The master could arrive at any time. Friends, don't complain about each other. A far greater complaint could be lodged against you, you know. The judge is standing just around the corner. Take the old prophets as your mentors. They put up with, they put up with anything, went through everything, and never once quit. All the time honoring God. What a gift life is to choose those who stay the course. You have heard, of course, of Job's, Job's, Job's staying power. And you know that God threw all of it together for him at the end. That because God cares, cares right down to the last detail. And since you know that he cares, let your language show it. Don't add words like I swear to God to your own words. Don't show your impatience by whatever that word is concocting, I can't read that one, concocting oaths to hurry up God. Just say yes or no. Just say what is true. That way your language cannot be used against you. Wow. Now do I need to reiterate my first statement? I grew up hearing this in my entire life that Christians... Cannot be rich. My entire life. Christians cannot be rich. Because rich. Is evil. What did, what did Steve say when he was up here? Half truths. Lies from the enemy. Deception. Steve had no idea what I was talking about today. This is exactly where the enemy has got the church. Exactly. The enemy would love nothing more than you to believe that God does not want you to prosper. Why in the world would the devil and the enemy want that? Because when Christians prosper, Christians give. And when Christians give and when things are given... It changes the situation. Again, grew up this way, right? So for us, for Laura and I, <clears throat> this process started a long time ago. This has been a journey. You know, the, tur the turtle and the hare, you know, the rabbit. Rabbit runs really fast. The turtle rules run, run, runs really slow. And you guys have read the, the children's thing, who wins the race? The turtle, right? Because the rabbit just goes all over the place. And the turtle just stays on path and finishes the race, right? This is what Laura and I have done. We've, we've become the turtle. Not on purpose. Not because of anything we did. Simply because God has directed us to do this. And we happen to be obedient and follow the word of the Lord. Have no idea how we did it, but we did it and we're headed down the right path. Have we got off track? Absolutely. We've turned into rabbits occasionally. But we've come back because God has continued to renew our minds and strengthen our minds and showed us to get back on the right path. This started downstairs for us in the youth room. Please, no one get offended from this. Please. Pretty please. We took over the youth ministry downstairs and we had, this was in the 90s. Yes, early 90s. Somewhere in that range. We had couches from 1960 in that youth room. And they stunk. They were dirty. They were donated from members of this church. They were disgusting. They were ugly. They were, all over, they were broken down. Plywood in the bottom to hold them together. Been screwed together three or four times to hold them together. 
My wife walked into, into the room one day, had no idea what she was saying. She does now, but back then she did not have any clue because we were there. We were living there. So she didn't know what she was saying because we were there. She walked in that room, that youth room, and she said, this is poverty mentality. The church deserves better than this. We had no clue what we were talking about. We were living in poverty mentality at the time. That was our lifestyle. That was us. And God started that journey of showing us and taking us through scriptures and lessons and teachings about money, renewing my mind and Laura's as well. And I'm going to do a selfish plug. I'm just going to be completely honest with you. Selfish 100% right now, okay? No God in this. This is Travis, selfish 100%, okay? If I had a book, you know, most people, when they come up here, they show a book. That's their selfish plug, and they've got a book table out there. They want you to stop and buy stuff on the way out. Okay, selfish plug. I'm doing a small group this year. Steve announced it. I've already signed up and got mine approved. I'm way ahead of you guys. I went straight to the source. I didn't fill out paperwork. I made an appointment with Pastor Ted and got it approved. Because God has put such a heavy burden on my heart to do this. I, I, I'm busting at the seams to do this. But I'm doing a selfish plug. I'm doing a small group. Everyone is invited to join my small group. It's going to be on kingdom money. Because I need you and I want you and I love you guys so much. I want you to get a taste of what God is showing me in this arena. Does that mean I'm perfect? Absolutely not. We're still learning. We're still, we're still on the path. We're still on the path. Matter of fact, Miss Sherry, uh, in, the, in the lobby one day, she started asking me questions, and I didn't have all the answers. But it made me go find the answers. So I'm on this journey. As soon as she asked me, I'm like, okay, i got to find out why. Why is she asking me that question, and why do I not have the answers? So I had to go research it and find the answers. We're still on the journey. And so I'm doing this small group because I want to talk about money. In James chapter, uh, chapter 5, verse 1, he's talking about it. And so I want to give you a kingdom perspective of it. It'll be on Sunday night, 6 o'clock in the children's church. And I'm excited about it. Okay, let's get back to God. That's enough of the selfish plug. Uh, First Timothy reiterates this uh, the kind of passage on James here. Matter of fact, Timothy says that money is kind of like a fire. It can be used for good or for evil. Think about that, fire. What's fire used for? Fire sometimes is used to warm us up, right? Cook. We cook on fire. Well, unless you've got an electric stove. We cook on fire. Cook. Fire is used for cooking stuff. Fire is used for warming, so fire can be used for good stuff, but also fire can be used for bad stuff, right? Fire can used to be used to destroy stuff. Money's the same way, Timothy said. I think the first point I want to make is, are we trying to go after God's wealth, or are we trying to go after our own wealth? See, here's, here's where James makes the distinction, okay? So James makes the distinction... Basically, he was giving a warning in chapter, in, in verse 1, 2, and 3, kind of in that area. James was giving a warning that said, basically, you guys that are getting rich, you're getting rich by cheating people. You're not paying your workers. You're not, you're not paying people that you owe money to. You're cheating them. Matter of fact, James said, it's just like you just shot somebody that was innocent, and you just shot them and killed them. You murdered them. Because you're cheating them out of what they deserved. So what was, that, what was happening in this time was they had workers out in the field that were working all day. And, and the, these, these landowners or these property owners or farmers or whatever language you want to use, they weren't paying their workers. So basically they were treating them like slaves and making them work for free instead of paying them a, a due diligence of a, of a labor, of a day's wages of working. They were cheating them. So they were getting rich by cheating other people. So James says, I want to warn you against judgment and oppression. Because you're getting rich by using judgments and oppression on other people. Yeah, and these are the people of Israel. These are God's chosen people. Christians. We're not talking about cheating a sinner. 
That's not right either, but we're not even talking about that. We're talking about Christians cheating Christians and claiming it all in the name of God by getting rich and, and being wealthy. God's not against wealth. Let me give you just a few examples. You guys remember Abraham in the Bible, Genesis? You guys remember some of these stories? Let me just, let me just highlight some of these stories real quick. <clears throat> Abram was very rich in livestock, silver, and gold. Huh, here's my favorite guy. What about Solomon? God, God said to Solomon, I will give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. Solomon didn't ask for riches and fame. God said, I'll give it to you because of the obedience of your father, David. Pastor Brian said he likes Old Testament. I love Old Testament. It is my favorite books in the Bible now. Didn't used to like them. I love them now. God says, I will give you what you did not ask for, riches and fame. No other king in all the world will ever be compared to you for the rest of eternity. No one will ever be. Can I, can I chase a rabbit? Do you guys mind just a second? Can I chase it? Is that okay? I did not give this to Kenny, so I apologize. If you happen to be on a smart Bible, or if you're fast at turning the pages, we should have done a Bible. What's that? What we used to do that? Sword drill. Bible's ready. First Kings chapter 4. So you don't hear the pages turn anymore. It's kind of funny. You would have heard the pages turn. I want to read you just a small set of verses. This is totally off my subject, but we're talking about wealth and God's not opposed to wealth. Let me, let me show you one example in the Bible. There's more, but let me show you one. This was King Solomon. King Solomon was given the, he was given the kingship of Israel because he was David's son. You know, King David, Goliath, everybody with me? This is his son, Solomon. It was not his oldest son. Okay, this was not his oldest son. This was not David's first son from his first wife. That's a whole nother scripture, a whole nother time of teaching when I'm not up here talking about money. Solomon had some battles to overcome to get to be king of Israel. Nonetheless, God appointed him king of Israel. So he was there by God's calling, not because he killed somebody. He ended up having to kill his brothers. That's a whole nother sermon. But that's not how he became king. Let me read you this. Verse 22. This is the daily food requirements of Solomon's palace. Okay? Daily food requirements of Solomon's palace. 150 bushels. I have no idea how much that is. But that's a lot. If you guys ever bought a bushel of corn, it's a pretty good sized container. 150 bushels of flour, 300 bushels of meal, 10 oxen. Now, I know what those are. If you want to see one of those, come out and feed cows with me tonight, and we'll call Henry up there, and he's about the size of an oxen. He's huge. 10 oxen every day. How many days are in a year? 365. You can do the math. Except they didn't butcher on Sunday, so you'd have to take off all the Sundays. 20 pasture-fed cows. That's 1,200 pounds of ca per cow right there. 20 of them every day. 100 sheep or goats, as well as some deers, gazelles, roe deer, and some choice poultry. Every day. And this was just in his palace. This was just for Solomon and his immediate workers. His guards, his servants, his wives, his children. Every day. Can you imagine the cook staff that had to prepare this? That's enough of that rabbit. God is not against wealth. You guys remember Job, right? He was wealthy. Then he lost it all. Why did he lose it all? Do we know? 
Yeah, he had it stolen from him, right? And he got into disobedience because he took some advice from, from friends, right? Some bad advice. What happened to Job at the end? Yeah. Clear in chapter 42 of Job, it said, When Job prayed for his friends and forgave them, the Lord restored all of his fortune. In fact, the Lord gave him twice as much as he had before. You know, not all the rich people in the Bible were good. Remember the rich, the rich young ruler? He said, Jesus, what do I have to do to follow you? And Jesus said, give up everything you own. Sell everything you own. Give it to the poor and follow me. What was the rich young ruler's response? No, thanks. Not interested. Why? Money was, his wrong, money was the wrong focus in his life. And Jesus knew that. Jesus wasn't against his wealth. Jesus was against his attitude towards wealth. Then the last, my, the last example I have is, do you remember the, um, what, what was his name? Um, Joseph was his name. When Jesus died on the cross and, and uh, they went to take him down out of the cross. Do you remember that <clears throat> Jesus didn't own a tomb? Okay. And no, none of his disciples owned a tomb. But there was a rich young man in the village that went to the, uh, to the uh, emperor, the king, and said, Can I have his body? I'm going to bury him in my tomb. That man was very wealthy. A matter of fact, he was on, that man, Joseph, was on the board of directors. It was on the um, executive board of the king. But it said, and it says in, in uh, Matthew that he he followed Christ with all of his heart. See, it comes down to me and what I'm going to be uh, sharing with you. And if you come to the small group, what's very important is wealth is just simply a matter of stewardship. The wealth is a part of your attitude and your mindset. James very clearly here said, you rich people that are stealing, your wealth's going to rot away. Very clearly. Because they got it with a wrong attitude, with a wrong deal. It comes down to this. God doesn't want you to hoard money. Okay, can I just be plain? God doesn't want you to hoard money. We need to create a show. You know, what, what was that hoarding show that was on where you would, uh, they would walk into houses, you know, there'd be newspapers all stacked up everywhere. We need to do a show about hoarding money. That probably wouldn't go over very well. Find all the rich people that are trying to be selfish and, and hide their money and, let's, you know, see how long they last. How do I know this is a true statement? If you go back and do some research on all the people that have won the lottery... Over the last 20 years. You will see that I am not lying to you. Because the people. Not all of them. I didn't say, I didn't say 100%. Okay, I'm not going to tell you it's 100%. I'm saying most of the people. In the last 20 years that have won the lottery. Are dead broke. Not against the lottery. I'm not up here telling you I'm against it. I'm just telling you that they got their money from wrong ambitions, from wrong attitude, from wrong uh, circumstances. They weren't prepared for money. They didn't have the mindset that they needed. They weren't, they weren't, um, they weren't living in the 100% obedience of God in relationship to the money. I'm not saying they weren't living a godly life. I'm just saying they weren't ready for that money. And when it came upon their life, the moths came and ate it away because they weren't ready. These people in the last day, that's why there was so much of this going on because they, they were so scared of the future. They were hoarding money because they were so scared that Jesus was going to come back any day and they wouldn't, they would, you know, th times were going to get in trouble and they just, they wouldn't have anything to live on. So they were storing up grains in their barn. They were storing up, uh, extra grain they wouldn't give any away they wouldn't share any and so they're all just they're just doing this selfish stuff and God and God and James is saying very clearly if you're going to be selfish with this it's all going to go away 
So my number one fix to all this is if you're gonna if you're gonna pursue money in relationship with God, you better prepare yourself to be generous. You better prepare yourself to be generous. Does everybody remember the story of the widow and the mites? I believe it's in um, uh, it's probably in more gospels. I know it's in Luke, for sure. But remember, all these people were coming by, and as they were dropping in the offering plate, great example. Great example. Remember James standing up here with the bo- uh, barrel while ago? None of you all did this, okay? But this is a great example. If so, uh, Steve, I'll use Steve as an example. Steve had a $100 bill, and so as he, him and, him and Evie are coming up here to give that $100 bill to missions, he's waving it around so y'all could see it. Look what I'm doing. That's what everybody was doing. Everybody was being that, that way. Steve was, you know, if Steve was coming up here, hey, I got a $100 bill, I'm going to drop it in the mission offering. Look, Joyce, 100 you know. There's his reward right there. That's not being generous. That's being a showboat. That's being proud. That's being selfish. That's hoarding your money. But instead, the widow came up and did it in private. Jesus was the one that saw her. No one else saw her. And said, looky here, this woman gave out of her heart. She didn't give out of pride. She gave out of her heart. Gave out of generosity. As I told you, we've walked this journey for a few years now. And it's getting intense. The journey is getting really intense for us. I'm just going to tell a little bit of my story. And I hope, I hope that's okay with you guys. But it's getting really intense for us right now. God has turned up the knob. So um, I learned how to use a convection oven yesterday. Yeah. 52 years old. And I've never used a convection oven. If you guys don't know what a convection oven is, I'll probably lie to you because I learned yesterday, so I really don't even know what it is myself. But basically, a convection oven is, is, is it's the same as a regular oven. It puts off heat, right? I mean, you know, you put on 350 and you get 350 degrees. Well, a convection oven will stir that heat up. So, sorry, but if an oven and a microwave had a baby, they would have a convection oven. Okay, that's my understanding of what it is. If I'm wrong, then I apologize, but that's basically how it works. And so I learned how to use one yesterday. So, I'm, you know, I, we put the food in there. And so, you know, 25 minutes or 30 minutes or whatever. And about 15 minutes, it's done. And I hadn't even started the other food yet. That's where, that's where God is taking Laura and I in this process. He stuck us in a convection oven. Because I was happy with being in the conventional oven. Matter of fact, I was happy with the old coal burner we were in. That way, you know, it kind of cooled down a little bit. And then somebody would add some more coals and it would heat back up. You know those old stoves? These kind of re- you couldn't regulate temperature. It was just up and down. I was perfectly happy with that method. You know, because then I could learn a little bit. God put in a few coals. I could learn a little bit and then it would cool down and I'd be good. I could do my own thing for a little while. You know, kind of go do what I wanted to do. Why well, it was cool. And then God would throw in a few more coals and I'd be I'd repent and you know, act, act spiritual again and then Yeah. You guys understand what I'm saying, right? I mean we've all been there. I hope I'm not the only one. We've all been there. Maybe not with money, but with other stuff. And God said, you know, the coal burner thing is pretty cool, but I like natural gas, and so he put us in a conventional oven and so we did that for a little while. And that was cool. I mean, because it was pretty constant heat and so you know, you can deal with God on a consistent basis, you know, every day kind of giving you something new. And so that's, so that's pretty cool, too. I kind of got used to that. I like that, too, because you go hot in the morning and you can kind of cool off towards the evening, kind of like the summertime around here. So that, that's not too bad either. But then God said, no, we're going to go the convection oven way. We're going to get you done in half the time. I'm assuming God's going to put us in the microwave next. I mean, that would be the progression of steps. And so I'm kind of already preparing for that. And so I'm, I'm, I mean, I'm okay with that. I'm preparing for that. But he's kind of taken us down this journey of understanding what James is saying to us. And again, remember, I said right from the very beginning that I didn't grow up being taught James and reading James. And so when I read James, I read it from a wrong perspective. And so 
when, when everybody was saying, you know, Christians are, are, are not supposed to be wealthy, they're not supposed to have prosperity, you know, all these guys on TV, now, disclaimer, okay, okay, all these guys on TV that get on here, oh, I'm believing God for an airplane, or I'm believing God for, you know, a building or whatever, I need $20 million for a building, man, I made fun of those guys. I did. I mean, not made fun of them. I, I mean, I'm talking embarrassing made fun of them. Ridiculed them almost. I'm like, you, you, you guys are, you ain't Christians, you're sinners. Asking people for money. And I know, I know you guys can probably give me examples of people that, you know, did it in a selfish lifestyle. I'm, I'm sure that all that's happened, okay? We're all humans. But James is, not, James is not saying that wealth is bad. He's saying that our attitude is what's bad. Our direction is bad. You know, in the second half, it's kind of, depending on what version of the Bible you read, it's actually like chapter, uh, verses 1 through 5 or like one thought about money. And then um, 7 through 12 is kind of like living patiently. A lot of Bibles break it up into two different segments. And so at first I was going to do that. And God told me, no, it all works together. 7 through 12 is about living patiently. So here's, here's where I connected the two together. God is returning soon. Okay, so that's a true statement. Now that's in God's perspective, not our perspective, right? So soon to God may mean something different to us, right? But God is returning soon. And so we have to live eternally, not temporarily. See, we got to live eternally, not temporarily. So I tie these two together like this. If God is going to bless us with prosperity and wealth, it's not for us to live temporarily. It's for us to live eternally. And I'm almost positive that my brother James, that's exactly what he was saying. God didn't give you guys, this is James, God didn't give you guys wealth so you could live temporarily. He gave you wealth so you could live eternally. We need to be patient and we need to trust God. So here's one thing I learned in this in reading of James. You guys think you can never learn anything out of the Bible? You can. So, in perspective, and Pastor always talks about this, and sometimes when he talks about this, I shut my hearing aid off. <laughs> I can say that. I, you guys do it too. Just, just blame me this time. Sometimes you all don't listen to Pastor. But you know, Pastor, for the 25 plus years I've served under him, he said this, you've got to read Scripture in context. And so as I was reading this, this is what I learned in context. Loved it. You know, it's like, hey, I learned something. So when the Israelites were in Egypt, they lived on an irrigation system. Okay? Now, I'm not a pro in this. Okay? So here's my perspective of this. So when they were in Egypt, they planted their fields on an irrigation system, which means there was basically a river running through the fields. And then they would draw water from that field through irrigation, through, through channels. You know, they would dig. Uh, if you guys have ever dug a, a septic line, it's the same concept. You know, every so feet, you've got to drop it a quarter of an inch so everything runs downhill. Okay? And if you don't, you learned your lesson never to do that again because then your toilet backs up. Okay. All right. Been there, done that. That's how I know. Um, so they lived on this irrigation system. So when they planted their fields in Egypt, they were slaves. Okay? The, the, the Israelites were slaves in Egypt, but when they planted those fields for the Egyptian kings, they lived on an irrigation system. They didn't have to believe for nothing. They just planted the seeds. The irrigation did its thing. The plants grew. They harvested it, give it to the king. All good. When they went out into the uh, left Egypt and went out on their own, they didn't have any irrigation get, ditches. Think about that. They went from easy, even though they were in slaves, their food was provided for them. May not been good, but it was provided by the Egyptian kings. So they had food. 
They planted and didn't have to do much work other than the planting. The irrigation systems did everything. Then when they went out, then they had to trust God for everything. James is writing in that perspective. I was like, as I read that and as I discovered that, I was like, that's where God has us right now. In reference to the money, I'm talking about James 5, money, being patient, having endurance, being the turtle instead of the hare. God has us right now living at a time where we have to trust God. We have to be patient and trust God. That is why, I made reference to it earlier, that is why the lottery system, the scratchers, and again, I'm not preaching against that. You guys want to do that, you go do it. It's your dollar, not mine, okay? That's why that's so popular because everybody's trying to get past the patience and endurance part. They're trying to go from zero to a hundred in one day. And God didn't design us that way. That's why, if you go back and you do the research of the lottery winners, that's why. Because they've lived in a poverty mentality their whole lives. And all of a sudden they get a check for a million dollars. They have no idea what to do with it. Financial people like Dave Ramsey will tell you that unless you change your habit and your, your uh, process... And your, the way you conduct your business, unless you change all that, money will not fix you. Because as soon as you get money, you'll go back to the same bad habits you had before. And you'll be back in the same boat you were in before. Yes. Gary Cassie, you guys are familiar with Gary Cassie. He's been at this church. He says the same thing. Unless you fix the problem, you can't fix the problem. Because money doesn't fix the problem. You've got to fix the problem. So this is what James is saying with, in regards to money. is You've got to be patient. You've got to do it God's way. My very first comment was, are you after God's wealth or are you after your own wealth? God's wealth requires patience. The last part, chapter, uh, verse 12 of James Seems like an oddball scripture. It's kind of out there in the middle of nowhere. And so I'm like, you know what, God? How do I tie verse 12 in with verses 1 through 11? I can do a good job with verses 1 through 11. And this is what he gave me. This one is, let your yes be yes and your no be no. Because our word is our character. It says, on, it says in the Message Bible, don't say, I swear to God. That was the language he used in the Message Bible. The New King James and the, and the, and the uh, New Living Translation said, don't, don't do an oath, which is like a contract. Don't do an oath. Let your yes be yes and your no's be no. And so God showed me in this scripture through this whole money thing, through living patiently, that my word... Is my character. And I should not have to sign a contract. In order to have character. I'm not against contracts. I think they're very needed in society. But a contract should not. Be my basis. For setting my character. My word should be my character. If I tell. Tell you that I'm going to do something. Then I need to do it. If I tell you I can't do something, then I shouldn't do it. Because my, my word is my character. And when it comes to money and finances and different things like that, your word sets the pace for your character. I want to finish with one last story before I quit. So, again, I'm telling you that God is taking us through this journey. And so we've had opportunity to, to be tested and, and God has used us to, to see if we're going to, to be true to our word. Because what we've done is we've told God, God, we're going to do this. I gave my word to God 
telling him I was going to renew my mind and change my way of thinking. Why am I doing that? Because I'm changing the generation of my family. I am changing the generation of my family. I've been doing some family research. And I love my family. Okay, My family is awesome. I had a great mother and father. I know, I know there's people in this church that can go through and say, well, you know, that wasn't my case. I understand that. That's not me. My dad and mom served in their local church. And my mom is still serving in her local church. And she's 87? 87. My dad died when he was 80, 86. Served up until the day he died. So that's my heritage. But I have learned, though they be perfect in a lot of ways, they were not perfect in all ways. And I'm changing some of those heritages. I'm taking the good stuff that my dad left me, and I'm taking the bad stuff, and I'm changing it for the future generation of the Walford household. I don't know that my dad knew how to change it. But I do know how to change it. God is showing me and I'm changing it. And I gave God my word that I would change it. And so he has given me opportunity to make sure that I am telling the truth. At Peter and uh, Evie's last visit, Laura and I felt uh, obligated to give. Just going to be honest with you. Can I do that? Is that okay with everybody? Okay, I'm just trying to help you here. Felt obligated to give, and so Laura and I communicated. I was in the media room, so we were communicating through text. And so we talked about it. Yes, we, we agree we need to give. And so I shot Laura an amount. She immediately gave me another one. I'm back in the media room in tears because that was the amount God gave me the first time but I wasn't man enough to do it I wasn't man enough to do it so I sat back there and cried by myself all by myself which is good by the way <laughs> if you're going to cry do it by yourself it's all good especially if you're a man. So I sat back there and cried because God gave me a small glimpse of being in the microwave. Yeah. This was before I was in the convection oven. <laughs> gave me a small glimpse and showed me that my yes is going to be yes and my no is going to be no. And I'm not going to rot away because I'm going to do it with patience and endurance and by following God. So I hope you did not grow up in a society where God taught you that you can't be rich. I hope you did not. But if you did, I'm sorry to tell you that you were taught wrong. God wants to bless you. He wants to prosper you. He wants you to be blessed beyond means so you can give it all away in the kingdom of God. And everything I said is right here. Everything. You can work extra hard. You can, you can do a, be a number cruncher. You can do all kinds of crazy stuff. But it boils down to are you going to change your mind? Because until you do, you're not going to change your wallet. Now, if you want to hear more, you can come on Sunday night at 6 o'clock. If you want to hear some more practical stuff, I'd be happy to give it to you. Uh, living in the kingdom's fun. Jump in the convection oven with me.
it's really not too bad. I promise, it's not too bad. It is a little hot, but it's not too bad. You know, uh, altar, minister, altar ministers, if you would, work your way up here. You know, when, uh, when you start talking about finances and money and all that, can I just tell you that, you know, one prayer is not going to fix you? <laughs> I wish it was that simple. I really do. Um, I wish you, if you were having, uh, if you heard something I said and you were like, man, I'm being selfish or, or uh, I'm not being very patient. You know, I'm trying to make things happen on my own, which is what most of us do, me included. Try to go make things happen. It's a humbling experience, by the way. If you, if you make things happen and you realize that God shows it to you, it's very humbling. And I didn't even give you all the humble stuff. That's for another sermon. I can't do it without crying, so I can't give that to you right now. I can't eat crow in front of you yet. But you know, if you need prayer today, We'll be happy to pray with you, but what I'm talking about today is a change in mindset. So what we would be happy to do for you today is we would be happy to come into agreement that God would show you what he needs to show you. Okay? So our altar minister would be happy to agree with you on that. They can't fix you with one prayer. But they'd be happy to agree that God would start showing you a new way of living. A new mindset. And it's going to take some work telling you it's going to take a lot of work I have read seven books since April and I didn't read until April and seven complete books and I got another one right there in front of me that was given to me today it's going to take some work for you to change your mindset